And the award goes to the Bigger Pockets podcast on the market. That is really good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> That's right, everyone. On the market has won an award. We'll tell you about that in just a minute. And today we're going to be doing our own award show to talk about the best and worst performances of the housing market this year. What's going on, everyone? I'm Dave Meyer, joined today by Kathy Fecky, James Daynard, and Henry Washington. Everyone is all dressed up and looking good, ready for the award show. <laughs> Henry, who are, who are you wearing today? Uh, 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 I am wearing uh, uh, Jossie Penney. Ooh, what is that? Uh, that's what we call JC Penny out here in Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> I was like trying to, it's like, he's making a joke, but I don't get it. <laughs> Jossie Penny. Very yeah. fancy. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think like me, you're probably doing the same thing. I'm wearing a tuxedo on top and sweatpants on the bottom because we're on a podcast and I don't have to wear a full tuxedo. I feel like James Dannard's in like a full tux though. I feel like he's got tux pants on. Yeah, you, James is. If your eyes are all listening to this, James is wearing a sequin tuxedo with. I think it's a like a a bow tie made out of money. Well, yeah, it's, your your t bow tie has to be made out of money. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is my recycled. I'm seeing coat from BP Con. Actually, my daughter picked it out for me. She's like, "This is the coat you're wearing on stage." I was like, "Really? This is what you picked out?" She's like, "This is what you're wearing." And so now I think this is my new award. I'm seeing lucky jacket. Good for you. And I should have asked Kathy because she'll actually have a real answer. But Kathy, what are you, what are you wearing to this fine event? Well, I am wearing. I don't know if you noticed my diamond necklace that I wore to the Taylor Swift concert that I picked up at CVS, but I'm pretty sure it is real diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Very elegant. I mean, from across the world and on a Zoom screen, it looks as real as can be. Thank you. <laughs> well, if you are all wondering why we're dressed up and wearing tuxedos and nice outfits and diamond necklaces, it's because On the Market was recognized as an honoree for the Webby Awards. This is an award that gets given out every year. 13,000 different podcasts applied this year, and we were chosen as one of the top 10 10 podcasts in the business category, and we're super excited about it. So we're getting all dolled up and we are taking a little victory lap on this show. So before we get into our content for this episode, I just want to say, Kathy, James, Henry, and Kaylin, our producer, congratulations on this award. And thank you all so much. And thanks to everyone also, the rest of the Bigger Pockets team who you don't get to hear from who also make this show possible. All right. And we didn't just get dressed up and come to this recording to just pat ourselves on the back, although we are proud. We are also going to be doing an awards ceremony on this show, and we're going to be giving out awards for our 2024 winners of the best housing region, best strategy for new investors, best strategy for experienced investors, and stick around to the end because we will be giving out a Razzie for the worst performance of the year, which I think you're going to want to hear about. During the award ceremony, you're going to hear our commentary on the winners and the losers and why we think the Academy selected the winners among all the nominees. All right, well, let's just get into our award show here. Our first award is for the best region to invest in in the United States. And the nominees are the Midwest, the West, the Pacific Northwest, the Southeast, and this, you guys are making me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hold it together. Just for everyone, for everyone listening, we have Kaylin, our producer, who is, we made her be the, the voice of the nominees. And I thought you were doing a great job, Kaylin, but we're keeping this all in, in the show for the record. But now you have to do it again. Okay. I'll take it all again. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the nominees are... The Midwest, the West, the Pacific Northwest, the Southeast, and the Southwest. All right. So those are our five nominees. We did not nominate the Northeast. Just no one wanted to nominate it. All right. So with that, I wish I had like, I need like a little envelope, uh, envelope. to open this up. Ah, we should have, uh, there wasn't uh. enough time. But the winner for the best region to invest in the United States 2024 is... The Midwest. We need like applause. 
Henry, I'm going to nominate you to accept this award on behalf of the Midwest. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the Midwest could not be here in person to accept their award, but I <laughs> humbly accept on the Midwest's behalf. And uh, I mean, I, I believe it is well deserved. The Midwest has continued to be an affordable place to invest while gaining appreciation. So I believe the Midwest deserves this recognition because it's often been poo-pooed on as a place where nobody wants to invest, but the unsexy markets have made a comeback. People have not only been able to afford to buy property, they have been afford to cash flow that property and they have now gained some appreciation along with it. Maybe not enough juice for James Daynard, but there's enough juice for the normal guy in the Midwest. <laughs> Oh, I love it. That's why you're a perfect uh, acceptance person for this, Henry. But seriously, I, I do think Midwest is a great 2024 region to win this award because we all know that the Southeast is very popular. It's experiencing the biggest migration. But once you everyone knows something, it's often too late to take advantage of it. And so we've all heard about the Southeast. It's been growing for years. And the Midwest might just be the great next thing. James, do you think, uh, are you feeling snubbed? The Pacific Northwest got snubbed here by the uh, by the Academy? You know what? I kind of feel like we did get snubbed. And you know what? This maybe wouldn't have been our year, but I think 2024 is going to be the year. And I actually think the Midwest, Southeast might slow down and we might see the expensive markets explode in 2024. All right. We'll just have to see. Kathy, what do you think? You know, my vote was for the Southeast, but the Academy wins. All right, well, let's dig into this a little bit. Kathy, why would you have voted for the Southeast? Well, it has the highest growth. There's the, the more migration moving into those areas. There's a lot of jobs moving into the areas. There's low taxes. And you can still get properties for under $300,000, even under 200000 if you look hard. And yet the, the appreciation has been pretty solid over the years. So I like to follow the migration patterns and the migration patterns are moving to the Southeast. With that said, I do love buy and hold in the Midwest. Um, it just doesn't see, you know, generally the same kind of growth. And you have to be careful because some of those markets are actually losing population. Yeah, that that is sort of the challenge with these regional awards or regional discussions is that within each region, there are just so many nuances and so many different markets. Uh, but are there any uh, areas in particular within the Southeast you like, Kathy? So many, uh, but definitely Florida. We like um, parts of Alabama, the Carolinas. So just that whole right bottom quadrant of the U.S. is really growing. It's warm, a warmer climate and still affordable. And a lot of those states have low, low taxes still. Do you think that one of the considerations that this prestigious academy considered in this thoughtful award uh, was how much insurance premiums have gone up in the Southeast over the last year and how that might be impacting cash flow. Henry, since you're in the Southeast, what do you think about that? Yeah, insurance has definitely been going up, not too terribly high where I'm at, but uh, pretty much all over the country, we're seeing insurance rates go up. And in some places, it's just hard in general to get any kind of coverage or to get enough coverage to cover your investment. So I think that's just going to be something that every region is going to have to watch out for going forward. All right. Well, I do want to, again, congratulate the Midwest on their well-deserved award. And hopefully we'll see some of these nominees back next year for the On the Market Housing Market Awards. Let's move on to our next award, which is for the best strategy for new investors. And the nominees are... Short-Term Rental Arbitrage, House Hacking, The Burr Strategy, and Crowdfund Investing. I, I think Kaylin's got a, a career as an announcer or I, I like so. the person who like reads out the stops on the subway or the bus. Like I feel like she's got a perfect voice for that. <laughs> All right. Well, we have four nominees. We have Short-Term Rental Arbitrage. If you're not familiar with that strategy, basically what it is, is signing a lease on an apartment that you do not own furnishing it, and then renting it out as a short-term rental. This is not legal or possible everywhere. Some places it is, and it can be a good strategy for some people. 
The second one is house hacking, which is basically just an owner occupied rental property where you buy a small multifamily, live in one unit, rent out the rest, or you buy a single family home and rent by the room. We have the Burr strategy, which is buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat, which is sort of like flipping a house, but you hold on to it at the end. So basically you do all this value add, increase the value of the property, but you hang on to it and rent it out. Or we have crowdfund investing, which is either investing in a syndication or a fund or basically one of our more passive options. And the winner for the 2024 OTM Awards goes to house hacking. Of Of course course. it goes to house hacking. This is just a layup. James, why do you think house hacking won? Well, I mean, house hacking is one of the best ways to get going in investing for any investor. A it doesn't require a lot of money. You can utilize a first-time home buying loan program where you're putting three to three and a half percent down. And then also you get a lower interest rate doing it owner occupied. And so it allows people to get cheaper debt, a lower payment, and less money in, which is always a great thing for investors. And I mean, house hacking is a great strategy. The only concern I have with it is it's hard to find inventory right now and you're competing against a lot of different people with that low first time home buyer uh, market. And so Inventory is a little light, hard to find a deal. Yeah, that that can be true. But don't do you think it like because house hacking doesn't necessarily need to cash flow to be a positive financial decision for you? Do you think that makes it a little bit easier? Yeah, I think it's it's all about that that affordable savings on your rent, right? And rents are high right now; they're you know at record levels. So as long as you can get it to where your payment is flush with your rent or you're gaining some equity in the deal, it's a no-brainer. And, you know, and especially because you can get on that journey of that owner-occupied tax gain and tax benefit mm-hmm. to where you get in the game with very low money down, you subsidize your housing costs, put some money back in your pocket, and then you can sell it tax-free in two years and walk with 100% of your profit. And so it really allows you to scale and grow as an investor. Yeah, I mean, I think house hacking also is is the clear winner because of the flexibility that comes with house hacking that maybe a lot of people don't talk about, but a lot of people are doing. You know, people people think of house hacking as buying a multifamily and living in one unit and renting out the others, but house hacking is really just finding a way to monetize your primary residence. Right. And you can do that a number of ways. You can rent out amenities within your home, like just renting out your swimming pool. You can rent a single room. You can rent a single room short term. You can rent a single room not long term. You can rent out storage space in your house. I know a lot of people are starting to do this with certain apps on the market where they're able to just rent out extra garage space. And so there's a ton of ways to house hack and allow somebody to essentially either utilize their house as an investment or to save money on their mortgage payment, which then they take that savings and then go invest in real estate. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I started my career in investing as a house hacker and I am still doing it today. You guys, as you know, we Airbnb parts of the house, we put a tiny home on the property. Um, we've used peer space where you can rent it for, you know, photography or um, filmmaking. So I'm, I love house hacking and can love it so much. I'm still doing it. I, I I'm with you, Kathy. That's how I got started. It's what I always recommend to people. And I do think that actually right now in 2024, house hacking is sort of having a a resurgence because it really makes sense right now. Like everyone said already, like, you know, rents are really high and there's all sorts of different ways that you can get into it. And I was actually just talking to someone on uh, the Bigger Pockets podcast or, or sister podcast about some lending programs that are also making house hacking easier now. Um, for example, you can now use income from an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, um, towards your qualification. If, so if you wanted to buy a house that has, you know, an apartment above a garage, that has actually become a lot easier. And they've also reduced the uh, down payment requirements for small multifamily investments. Um, and so there are a lot of new financing options that actually are making house hacking more attractive than it, maybe it's ever been. And so that's, I think, why the Academy selected house hacking this year. (laughs) And I would like to say, I know a lot of people are probably looking at Burr and thinking, man, that probably got snubbed. But I do really think that the the widespread adoption of house hacking makes it the winner. Burr is a great strategy for new investors, but the barrier to entry is higher because you have to be a fundamentally sound investor to pull off a winning Burr deal. 
in this economy. You can't just walk into something that's going to cash flow on day one. You really got to put in the work to get there. And so although Burr is a great strategy, I believe it's a whole lot easier for the everyday normal beginner to walk into a house hack deal. And I think you should Burr and house hack at the same time. Mm -hmm. Buy it cheap refinance it. It saves your down payment and your cash out of pocket. I like a blend on this. Ooh. It is the best way to maximize yourself as a new investor. I like that idea. That's yeah. also, that's nice too, because if you're living in it, you might not be under the same time crunch to burr. Like I, I kind of like the idea for new investors of like buying something, moving into it, and then maybe doing the renovations over time once you get a little bit comfortable with your investment. Or would you recommend it immediately, James? You know, I would rather just do it immediately because you can utilize leverage and you can get the rehab component added in. And once that property has been improved in value, you can refinance all your cash back out. You're going to have a lower rate and no PMI payment. And so all those things are going to make it more affordable, create more equity. And then also you get way faster to that tax-free 250 or 500 gain in two years. And that is where you can get big impact in your portfolio growth. All right. Well, now, James, you need to you need to brand that. We need a name for it. What's the the house hack burr <laughs> hybrid going to be called? Cold house, cold house. I don't know. Let me let me think of that. <laughs> cold house. I, I like what you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll get we'll get back to you on that one for for next year award. I'll, I'll think of some sort of name for it. All right. Well, let's move on to our third award, which is for our best strategy for experienced investors. Just as a reminder, the previous one was for new investors. Now we're moving on to experienced investors. And the 2024 nominees are flipping, syndication, private money lending, and seller financing. That might be the snub for Burr. Burr didn't even make the list of nominations this year for experience investors. But, you know, the Academy does what the Academy does. We're not here to <laughs> debate them. And the winner this year for best strategy for experience investors is private money lending. James, as a private money lender yourself, can you tell us a little bit about why you think this was uh, either a good or bad decision by the Academy? Well, I think it's the best decision you can make if you have saved up your capital, you have, you know, that's why it's so important. Don't spend your money, save it, compound it, and then start being the bank. Because everyone thinks it's private money lending is you make interest and points. And that is true. You can make 10 to 12%. You can make two points. But one of the other beautiful things about being the private lender is you can also get equity in properties and flip homes passively. You can get Burr properties passively and you can just get yourself involved and really get to financial freedom. And so that's why if you've saved up cash, you know, there's, there's an old saying, the man with all the gold makes all the rules. That is true. You can dictate terms, get into deals and also just collect that cash flow and that mailbox money without having to do a lot of the work. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Kathy, have you ever uh, gotten into private money lending? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it's kind of when I started investing, I met some mentors who said, you know, this is where you want to get. To me, it's kind of the ultimate end place for an investor because now you don't really have to do the work anymore. You're just lending the money. The money is your resource and you make money from your money. So you get to let someone else do the work. <laughs> so yes, we've done, we've done it, but you have to be careful and you have to know what you're doing. Don't be giving your money to just anybody. I have someone who borrowed it who hasn't paid it back yet. So it, you, again, there's a lot of due diligence that goes into private lending. Don't be casual with it. Yeah. To me, this had to be the clear winner just with, I mean, the higher interest rates go for everyone else. That means the more interest that private lenders are able to charge. And so look, uh, we're doing it's tax time and I have to pull the statements and see what I'm paying each of my private money lenders for every deal that I've done. And it is the cash flow that they get far supersedes any cash flow I'm getting on these rentals that I'm buying. And so it is it is definitely the uh, the pinnacle of real estate investing because it's truly passive or it can be truly passive if you can get somebody in there to help coordinate the transactions for you. And it's, it's literal mailbox money. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems great. I, I invest in private money funds, which has been fantastic. I haven't done it directly yet. Uh, but I just read a great book by bigger pockets called lend to live. If you guys want to learn anything more about the 2024 
winner of the OTM Best Strategy for Experienced Investors. You can check that out and learn a bit more about it there. But it does just seem like if you know a lot about real estate, which is a requirement, it's it's kind of hard to get into, it seems like, if you're not experienced with buying deals yourself and understand how to underwrite deals. Um, but if you're doing it, um, I think it could be uh, a great strategy for all of you. And the Academy seems to agree. <laughs> Do you think uh, any of these other ones were snubbed or should be considered, uh, uh, Henry, flipping, syndication, seller financing? Potentially syndication, but you, those are risky too. You really have to get in with the right operators, experienced operators, ones who are more focused on making sure that their uh, investors are getting paid than lining their own pockets uh, in the beginning. And, uh, but that can also be pretty passive and lucrative, uh, in terms of, uh, a more experienced strategy flipping. I would never say flipping is like the top strategy. There's just a lot of work in flipping. It's just not for everyone. You really got to be built for flipping. So no, I think this, I think, I think this is a, this is a good list. Yeah. I would say that syndication could definitely be at least tied with first place, um, definitely in second place. If you are a syndicator, it is a way to kind of have unlimited resources to be able to acquire more things because you're bringing in investor dollars. Uh, but you better be experienced and you better be able to return that money to the investors if you hope to continue uh, to syndicate. And if you are investing in a syndication, you know, we've had some deals that have returned 30, 35% returns annually. So it can be very lucrative. But like uh, Henry said, you can also lose all of your capital if you're an equity investor. Because the, the debt gets paid, remember, the debt gets paid first, which was why private money lending takes first place. Because if you're an equity investor in a syndication, debt gets paid first. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an investor in syndications. I think they're great. I don't think 2023 or 2024 is the best time to get into syndications personally. I think there are less good deals than there were in the past. It's a little mm -hmm. bit riskier than it has been, um, which is why uh, I support the Academy's decision here. But I do think for going forward, syndications can be great, uh, especially if commercial real estate continues to uh, see values decline in the next few years. There's going to be a lot of good opportunities. All right, let's move on to our final award for the OTM Awards. It is a Razzie. If you've never heard of a Razzie, it's uh, an award show that goes on every year where they basically just give out awards to the worst movies of the year. It's like worst film, worst actor, worst actress. I think Tom Green was the first person to ever show up and accept the award for a <laughs> Razzie, which is hilarious. Uh, but we're going to be doing that this year. We're going to be giving an award to the thing that is negatively impacting investors the most. Kaylin, what are our nominees? And the nominees are lack of housing inventory, high interest rates, inflation, YouTube crash bros. <laughs> okay, so our four nominees are the lack of housing inventory. We've covered that a lot on this show. We also have high interest rates, making things less affordable. Inflation, which is just damaging spending power throughout the economy. And YouTube crash bros, which is a term that we are borrowing from our friend Logan Motoshami, uh, basically to describe people who basis, baselessly are inspiring a lot of fear about crashes in the housing market that have yet to materialize. And the winner goes to YouTube crash bros. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love it so much. Now, like I, I just I'll I'll start with this one because I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that you think the housing market is going to decline or to crash if you genuinely think that. But the YouTube crash bros are a particular breed of individual that just no matter what happens, they say that the market is going to crash. And even though there is evidence and logic to the contrary, they keep saying the housing market's going to crash. And to me, that is dishonest. And it is negatively impacting a lot of people who could have gotten into the housing market previously, or are still waiting on the sidelines because they believe these people, despite the evidence. Uh, and frankly, they're probably just trying to get clicks and views for their channel and don't care at all about the people who are actually watching their videos. 
Yeah, you know, I've seen some of these guys actually do believe what they're saying, and it, they just don't have the data. Uh, so, you know, make sure you get the charts and you can see why, you know, what's backing up their decision. If it is prices have hit all time highs, well, that is a data point, but that's not, it's <laughs> not one that's gonna, uh, that really means that the housing market is in a bubble. That it, it's, uh, there's a whole lot of other factors, but it seems like that's what a lot of people have been saying is, oh, they, prices just can't keep going up. Well, <laughs> they are due to supply and demand. Well, eventually they'll be right. Cause <laughs> if they just beat that drum for long enough, I mean, it could be in two years, it could be five, it could be 10, but eventually they will be right. But I think it's that doom and gloom that everyone likes that, you know, it's always that, that the flames in the background, what's that story? Market's going to crash, market's going to crash. And, you know, also people got to understand that that's just a lot of clickbait on the internet. Go to factual sources and not all opinion pieces. And if, as an investor, dig into the data, dig into what's going on in your market, and then make a logical decision and just ignore all the noise out there. Uh, but, you know, eventually they will be right. Yeah, they will be right. But, you know, I think what's holding them back is probably the number one nominee on this list, which is probably the most disruptive thing on this list that people talk about, but not really, which is the lack of housing inventory. I mean, if there's a lack of housing inventory, it's hard to see how a crash is going to happen. But that lack of housing inventory is having an impact, a major impact on the housing market. And I think it'll continue to because it's not just housing inventory, but it's affordable housing inventory. And so I, I don't know that a lot of people aren't really talking about what happens if this problem doesn't get solved. Like, how does that impact real estate for the normal home buyer and how does that impact real estate for the investors like us so that that to me is the one on this list you got to keep your eye on yeah you either have to wipe out a huge mo amount of the population or you need to bring on a bunch of new supply and you know hopefully neither i mean let's yeah, not, kathy let's not get into the first stop let's, let's not get into that first stop let's I don't not want to hear about wiping let's, out let's not thanos let's not thanos the country and let's just figure out how to buy more out. <laughs> yeah this is this is the plot of the next avengers movie <laughs> and they just build houses like captain america just gets a bunch of dudes <laughs> they just build houses super oh, fast that's actually what america needs we need captain america to just start building a affordable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like if one of these tech companies actually does find a way to produce housing really inexpensively, and if cities go along with it, and there's enough resources, water, mm -hmm. electrical, you know, there's there's a whole lot besides just building a house that goes into providing housing, you've got to have the hookups there, you've got to have the water and the electrical and, and traffic, you know, you don't want to overwhelm cities with traffic. Uh, but if we overcome those things, and suddenly are able to bring on a whole lot of new supply, well, then you know, prices would come down. But so far, uh, you know, you hear all kinds of numbers, but the last number I heard is we're three and a half million homes short of demand. And, uh, you know, that's not going to change anytime soon. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Kathy. I do, I do want to get back to something that uh, James and Henry were just talking about, that they'll be right eventually. Like, I guess, kind of, but it sort of depends on your definition of a crash. Because I think people just start to say that any decline in housing prices is a crash <laughs> to prove their point. And they're like, oh, in one market, it went down 1%. Like, that's a crash. Like, no, that's a normal correction or a normal fluctuation in housing prices. To me, a crash, quote unquote, is like 10% decline, maybe even more, 10% decline in housing prices on a national basis. And for my data, that's happened exactly one time in US history. So like, they might be right. They also might not anytime in the next decade. So who knows? But hopefully you're listening to this podcast. And although we are not always correct, and we're uh, often wrong, uh, you know, we do I like to think that we have a lot of integrity and try to bring our honest opinions about what is going to happen. And we actually do the things that we are talking about on this show and, and back it up with real action and not just, uh, you know, saying things for the sake of saying things and getting downloads. Maybe that's why we won an award. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. You all look so beautiful today. This has been a very fun podcast. Kaylin, thank you so much for putting this together. And most of all, thank you all for listening to the show. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't get to do this several times a week, have all the fun that we get to have and win awards like the prestigious one we just won for 2023. If you want to further our victory tour and give us a little extra bump of love 
We appreciate a honest review on either Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. And to make sure you are getting all of our episodes right when they drop or any bonus episodes that we put out, make sure to follow us on Apple or Spotify as well. Thank you all so much for your support. We'll see you for the next episode of On The Market. On The Market was created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kalen Bennett. The show is produced by Kalen Bennett with editing by Exodus Media. Copywriting is by Calico Content, and we want to extend a big thank you to everyone at Bigger Pockets for making this show possible.